Hey, everybody. Yesterday was, well, it was fantastically interesting. I love days like yesterday because they offer so much for us to look at. Like, let's examine the clues of how there were tornadoes in Northwest Texas yesterday. To me, this is like, this is a fantastically, amazingly, perfectly interesting case study to look at because I think there's a couple of things that we can learn as we move into storm season, right? There's a lot of things we can look at. So yesterday was a fluke or was it not a fluke? Let's take a look at it. Let's dive in. So yesterday's event was quite interesting. You had two tornadoes that happened in Northwest Texas right here, right there in Northwest Texas. Uh, and then you had a scattering of severe weather reports around it. You can see just a bunch. And then there were a few down here. Interestingly enough, if you remember from yesterday's outlook, there was a hatch tail area down here, and that didn't come to pass. Everything was concentrated to the north. So why was that? What happened yesterday? Why was it not the day we expected, but also the day we kind of expected? Because there was a 2% that kind of went uh, all the way, you know, it was kind of this, right? There was a 2% that went in that general direction. So why, why, why did this happen? Well, let's... Uh, Let's take a look at it, shall we? Let's let's go into the meteorological details. First off, I want to do, I, let's go from top down on this because I think it's important to kind of break it down from a top down perspective. Uh, here you can see the jet stream, the upper jet is just sliding right on in and it's doing this number. That's the upper level jet, right? These tornadoes happen in this area right here. This is kind of the area, this is kind of the time. This is in that there's no perfect time on meso analysis to look at for these tornadoes, but kind of in this time period. And you can see there's some good diffluence or divergence aloft uh, moving in. You can see that right here. This is actually, if you're look, wanting to know about jet dynamics, this is that favorable left exit region of the jet. It's where it's coming in and that air is evacuating aloft, which how do you then feel that? You feel that with air from below, so it creates lift. And so what's happening here is that this jet is moving in and there's just a lot of lift going on here. And there were a lot of storms. This probably, it was interesting because models didn't develop storms here in the morning. If you remember, if you look back in the video yesterday and look at those model images, there were not many storms here. But looking at this, it's kind of obvious where those storms might have formed, right? Uh, so again, this is why mesoanalysis and make your own forecast is important uh, for sure. I probably would have missed this if I had chased yesterday. I don't know if I would have. We'll see. I actually like that area, but I, I just don't know. Because the uh, if you look at then the 500 millibar uh, jet, it's a little bit different, right? Uh, the mid-level jet stream, because I feel like uh, this is displaced further north. That left exit region is more like up in here somewhere. Oh my gosh, that was a terrible circle. Up in here somewhere. Uh, but but you can see, once again, that flow is just coming in and then it's turning Maradona up here. Nothing up here. Instability never got going. And, and then you had like stronger flow down here, of course. But this is kind of in an unfavorable area of the jet. And you just didn't really get the storms form along that that you expected. Let's uh, go back and forth. You can see how different these two areas of the jet look like. So you can see this kind of extension up here as it goes, right? You can kind of see that, but it's not the same, right? It's not the same at all. So as we move for, uh, down the pike here, let's go down the 850. This is where your low level winds are, right? This is where you're looking for uh, that kind of stuff. You see your flow, uh, kind of this number, this number, something like that, maybe even like this, but these tornadoes were occurring uh, in this area, let's make that red so it's easier to see. So this is right on the edge of the moist air. This is right on the edge of the dry, dry line slash Pacific front. It was kind of a little bit of a both, one of those hybrids, but there was uh, 20 knots of low level flow there. So that's not bad. So, so far from the top down to 850, we see there's quite a bit going on. That's kind of favorable, but not but not like overly. This is not like an obvious, like, oh my God, there's going to be tornadoes today signal. This is uh, severe weather and there's enough turning there that you can get supercells and even a tornado if things work out, right? So taking a look at the surface here, this surface flow really backed, right? You have southeast, even east, southeast, you know, in this area where those tornadoes happen, that's some good back surface flow. Meso analysis was indicating there was no convective inhibition from the surface here, which I think is one of the, it's not like necessary, necessary, but I think it's like 
a, an extremely beneficial piece of the puzzle when we're looking at like tornado potential. So all of that was in place there. The, the turning of the winds was great. You had really, really, really good backed low level flow. That's going to come into play a little bit later when we're looking at the ingredients. Your LCLs, again, this is your cloud-based heights. This is low. This is really low through here. Very low, very favorable. This is this is like it does not take much from here to get tornadoes. So your LCLs are great. Your shear is great. Uh, all favorable. Your LCLs are great. Your shear is favorable. Your, let's take a look at your storm relative flow. Now, what? why is this important? This is the storm relative flow in the mid-level of the atmosphere. If you see 15 or above, this is where 15 is kind of the cutoff line between tornadic and non-tornadic on this chart. And you can see very clearly we have 20 knots all through here. So mesoanalysis is pointing out 20 knots. This is favorable for that. Now, your low level uh, flow, you need 20 knots or above for sustained supercells typically. Uh, and also it determines the size of your storms. Less of this, smaller storms, more of this, probably bigger storms, right? Uh, once again, we're setting comfortably there. So that's good. And again, this determines your type of supercell, typically 9 to 11 kilometer storm relative flow. This was indicating classic type of supercells are going to be likely. So lots of, lot, lots there. Once again, we are, we are just like marching on here. Lots of really favorable signals. Here's the 0 to 1 kilometer SRH. Now, this is where we start getting into the, hmm, what really was going on here? Because... Look at this. This is only 100, maybe even 50 to 100, uh, 150 north and east. But this was not the strongest 0 to 1 kilometer SRH you've ever seen. 100 or above is about where we start thinking tornadoes are possible, but that involves like needing a few other things. Uh, as we saw, the instability was not the highest. This is not the a high instability environment. So what was going on here? Like why was there really good. Uh, why did why, that turning? That's, we'll, we'll look at a sounding in a second. We'll break that down. But looking at zero to 500 meter SRH, a little better. It's 50 to 100. That's right there. That's the good stuff right there. It's a little different than uh, zero to one kilometer. But once you see 100, you're doing really favorable. 50 is pretty good. So so the turning, the storm relativity in the bottom parts of the atmosphere, really good. The very lowest and as you go up, it was a little less, but still good, solid, solid enough to count. Uh, critical angle. So this is where we start getting into the, okay, this makes a little bit more sense, right? Because when you're looking at critical angles, you're looking for that right there, a 90. If you're anything close to 90 means your vorticity being sucked into the storms is going to be streamwise. Streamwise vorticity is really good because the storm doesn't have to do anything else with that. That air is turning. As it goes in, turning as it goes up, there's nothing the storm has to do to ingest that vorticity except just breathe in. So 90 is really good. And look what's happening right here, right? Seeing 90. So this was, I think, a big component of yesterday is that you had nearly perfectly streamwise vorticity coming into these storms. And that really took, like, like that's like jet fuel. That kind of brings everything together. That makes this a lot more conducive. It doesn't take as much then. It doesn't take as much zero to one kilometer SRH. You got low LCLs, 90 critical angles, supercell storm mode. Well, things start happening, right? So I think that's what we're getting there. Now we're starting to put some puzzle pieces together why this might have happened. Because before it was like supercell, but tornado, I don't know. This is first real sign that, oh, this makes a little bit more sense. Now here we go again. 3 cape and surface vorticity. What do you see? Uh, this is called the storm chase cheat code by many because when you see good, strong 3 cape overlaid with good, strong surface vorticity, and then you add in the fact the critical angles are really good, guess what? We're starting to really roll here because you see both of these lining up 100, 0 to one, uh, 3 kilometer uh, cape, really good surface vorticity all overlaying this area in Northwest Texas. So this was another piece of the puzzle. This is, we're, we're starting to see it now. We're putting this together, why this happened. Uh, and so let's go to the next one. Tornadic EHI, anything over one, considered favorable on this index. The further you get from one, the better it is, but you had a solid one here. I don't even need to highlight that to point that out, right? 
So here we go, tilting and stretching again. Two is best one you can make work. Uh, and you had ones here, might even been a localized two on this index. These are experimental from the Storm Prediction Center. But personally, I love both of these last two on mesoanalysis. You can see good, solid, uh, good, solid numbers. Tilting and stretching, I think it's just kind of a, uh, it, it's, I, I look at it as like a complement to that three cape and vorticity chart. So, but very good, very good. And the tour probs, uh, not, nothing special here, right? Nothing looking special. Uh, I'm not sure about the usefulness of this chart, may not even make it to the operational stage, but I think it's it, it, it was showing that there was a non-zero chance. So we're just going to run with that. Now let's get into nitty gritty because this is where uh, the money's made, so to speak, right? So let's uh, talk about that. Let's actually put this full screen, full, full screen. Yeah, there we go. So, so zooming in here, you can see, uh, you can see right now we had a 10 degree difference, 66 for a surface temperature. Well, that's pretty cool. That's not what you typically see um, on these types of setups. But yeah, you have a 66 over 56. Look at this turning. This isn't even properly. Uh, this is this is showing a decent. Uh, version of the atmosphere, but I think the surface winds might even been slightly more back. So, but you go down here, your surface to one kilometer uh, SRH 172. I should note this is a sounding from the HRRR near the storm at the time of tornado, uh, 216 surface to three kilometers. So, not real, just enough, just enough for supercell surface six kilometer bulk shear 48. Um, you see your four to cl six kilometer SR wind. This has 15. So it was right there in the tornado, non-tornado, three cape over here, 102. Um, I mean, you look around, there's just a lot of different good things coming. Uh, D, D cape was low, which was good for this. And this is kind of a contaminated sounding too. I acknowledge that. Uh, storm uh, info layer here. Uh, this had some surface uh, inhibition. Uh, most likely that was not the case. So this is not a perfect rendition of the atmosphere, I don't think. But you look here, critical angle, 86. That's really good. And you see your hodograph shape. Good curvature in the zero to three kilometer, a little bit of backing aloft. You see that here, backing aloft and even some backing here. So there was some backing going on, but overall this was solid shear, solid everything. Looks like a day that... If a few things go your way, you could get a tornado. This is not the most outrageously awesome, um, outrageously awesome environment you're ever going to see. It's just not. But it was an environment that produced a tornado. So let's take a look at the radar loop. I think this will be highly instructive about what might have happened. So we know we have a background environment. We know we have a background environment that was supportive of tornadoes if a few things go your way, right? Well, here you can see this tornado forms right there, dives southeast, another one formed uh, very quickly after that. But tornado forms, it dives actually southeast a little bit, then uh, lifts up north. So this tornado formed and went around the uh, meso a little bit, actually did that deviant motion. So there's something happening in this, though, that I think we need to pay attention to. Let's go to singular images, and we are going to look this up. Okay, so let's take a look at the radar image here. So I think this is gonna be highly instructive. Here, you see the supercell, RFD right here, the hook echo, that's the RFD, and that's the supercell. You also have, this is the updraft, that RFD is eating into the updraft. Your updraft's gonna be shaped like that. Your tornado is gonna be back here. Okay, your tornado's in this area. So, so as this storm happens to go, right, Let's take a look at this. This is one supercell, but look at what this is doing. What's this happening back here? This is another strong storm. What you're going to see, I think, and this was probably what took this from, and eh, maybe there could be a tornado to, oh, there's a tornado, is I think this storm right here favorably interacted with this storm right here. I think there was a favorable interaction that enhanced the RFD that caused this storm to tornado. I think that's exactly what happened. A lot of these marginal days like this, I think it comes down to weird storm interactions that can take you from there's enough here for a tornado to there is now a tornado. I think it's typically rarely just storm scale. It's going to be like, uh, it's going to be storm interactions on the storm scale. It's not going to be just one storm doing it. It's going to be other storms helping it. 
because sometimes storms need helpers. Okay, so here is this. Here, here's this looking again. You can see likely a tornado going on. That was not very good um, right here. So there's likely a tornado going on. Let's circle that as of this point. And you can see this RFD right here. This storm, I think, is falling into what is the rear flank downdraft. That rain is. And it's being wrapped around. I think that's exactly what's happening here. And that RFD is then being enhanced, and you can then see what happens, right? Because you go down, let's go down one. This RFD has gotten thicker here. This has gotten thicker. There's more rain. This storm is dying rapidly, but you're seeing like this rain kind of wrapping around the backside here. And of course, you have a tornado clearly ongoing over here. So I think there was a very favorable storm scale interaction here that caused this to happen. Because you jump ahead one more. Let's do that really quick. And you can see this RFD, this RFD is now just very thick. Uh, there's a very clear tornado going on here. Let me pull up the annotation again so we can do this. Obviously, right here is your tornado. And it's happening in this area right here. So this uh, RFD has cut, is cutting into this updraft. There's a tornado. This storm back here is all but gone. But this storm's core has strengthened. The lead storm's core has strengthened. It's also getting a funky shape. I think that's because these are interacting, but that was inter was locally enhancing that RFD. And as we move forward one more, you can see the tornado clearly ongoing. You can see that fat hook now. The storm back here is completely gone, just about. And you have a tornado that is actually on the way out at this point. And you can see here, now it's all but gone as that... Uh, Roof flank down draft as that interaction ceases, the tornado ceases to be too. So let's just loop through that. You can see how this happens, right? You can see how these storms interact with each other right here. Really nice, right? Real, re, you just like, let's just keep cycling back through here. And you can see just that storm in the rear is being sucked into the lead one. I think that it locally enhanced the RFD with all the other ingredients in place that we've gone through where this storm could take advantage of spin, but it just, there wasn't enough there initially, but the storm interaction brought the whole thing home. And I think that's exactly what happened. And this storm produced a tornado. Hey, I hope this uh, recap was interesting. I hope it was informative because quite honestly, um, I want to do more of these this year. We're going to see uh, keeping up a strong pace of videos through storm season is going to be challenging, but I'm going to try my best. With that said, be sure to subscribe because we're going to do a lot of this and we'll see you next time.